whether I'm a businessman or not is uh, yet to be determined. All the decades of travel and food has given Anthony Bourdain new purpose. In two years' time, the gourmand hopes to take home all the flavors he fell in love with abroad to his home in New York. Bourdain envisions a namesake market on the west side of Manhattan in Pier 57 by the Hudson River. Do tell us about Bourdain Market. What's, what's the mission this Look, time? We around? hope to create a space, uh, a public market, with the kind of uh, democratic, available, reasonably priced street food that so many other countries in the world yeah. see as a birthright, yeah. like Hong Kong, like Singapore, yeah. to a great extent, like Manila. I thought this was a cool thing that New Yorkers should have, especially as, a, as an immigrant city where so many cultures are heavily represented. Why don't we have such a thing? This is not a food court. Okay. This is a public market where okay. you can go to buy produce and, and meat from the butcher and fish. Uh, it's a public property. You park on the roof and individually owned and operated businesses selling what they've been selling presumably for many generations. This is not a compendium of chains. This is not a disnified version of a uh, or, or recreation of a Singapore hawker center. Okay. Uh, this is a real market. Filipinos, as you know, are, are quite eager to know how we're going to be represented, who's going to represent us. What, but one basic question we want to ask is, with you coming here and uh, presumably looking for Filipino vendors, is this at least a hopeful sign that uh, it's not too late to fix our association with Balut? You know, it, 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 yeah, this, this, this setback, uh, I think it, it freaked a lot of Americans out. That I should point out my daughter is 10 years old. She loves Balut. Yeah. 10-year-old, American kid, she loves it. Uh, so ain't nothing wrong with that. But I think as, if you're looking to put your best foot forward for cracking the international market, I think there might be more accessible dishes. I think Sisig is the perfect, ballistically designed dish to win the hearts and minds of people everywhere. It's perfect in every way. It goes well with beer. Okay. You want it when drunk. Yeah. It's pork. Yeah. It's delicious. It's texturally interesting and it fits right in with the current sort of hipster zeitgeist. The world is ready for Sisi. I was talking to uh, a Thai foodie one time and he said, you know, obviously Thai food is number one for him, but mm -hmm. he was saying, you know, actually, to be honest with you, after Thai food, I would actually rank the Philippine food ahead of Singapore, ahead of Malaysia in terms of diversity and taste. He said, but he said, and that's what I want to ask you, he said, the problem with Filipino food is actually it's too diverse. There's nothing I can hold to. Italian, you have pasta and pizza. Uh, in Singapore, among Filipinos, you, you will think of chili crabs and so on. Do you agree that, you know, we, we don't brand it around, let's say, a troika of dishes or? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, when you've got 6,000 plus islands, um, focus is a difficulty. Uh, on the other hand, it's a tremendous asset. Yeah. It just means I mean, it took a long, long time for Americans to understand that Italy is a regional country, that all Italian food is not like red sauce and meatballs. Uh, you know, we only discovered, you know, Tuscany uh, not too long ago. And we have yet to discover, I mean, at least to most of America, I mean, couldn't differentiate between Puglia and Emilia Romagna or, or Lombardy or much less Sardinia. Yeah. So you were not alone in this, uh, in, 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 in this predicament. Speaking of best foot forward, apart from CSIG, what would be the best foot forward, given that we have a limited time, limited window? No, that's what's, a, what's I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a limited time at all. I mean, it's a good evolve, like any market, it evolves yeah. over yeah. time. Okay. I mean, there's so many great Filipino, you know, many adobos, uh, uh, city gang, uh, pastries, um, lumpia, just off the top of my head. Okay. I mean, lechon, of course. Are there, are there any cuisines that you think, I mean, given that it's, it, 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 it represents the whole global community, are there nonetheless any, any anchor cuisines that you think absolutely have to be there? Are there any, are there 
particular cuisines from around the world, Japanese, Italian? Yeah, Korean. I think uh, Mexico. I mean, these are personal choices based yes. on my own passions. Uh, I think true regional Mexican street food, Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, these are all, I, I think, sort of essential and as importantly, I believe will do well uh, in a New York environment. After the break, Anthony Bourdain tells us why he hopes to bring lowly street food to the Big Apple. Stay tuned. In the past years, Anthony Bourdain has been searching far and wide to find the perfect street food to complement the offerings in his upcoming Bourdain Market in New York. Why street food? Because street food is good food. It's what fast food should be. It's yeah. fast, it's affordable, it's made by real people who are speaking to you and communicating something to you rather than, you know, a mascot, That's you know, the king, the clown, or the colonel. People say now that you know that the world now is, 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 is nations are much more inward looking. There's Brexit. We have Trump nationalist movements yeah. uh, all over, including here in, in in our part of the world. What do you think is the role of food? Um, I think old people feel that way, and as uh, demographics change, the already food obsessed younger generations will uh, will continue to look outside their own borders and outside of their own shoes. Let us hope. What's the process for vetting uh, your vendors? We don't really have a process yet. We're, we have a, a, a general wish list, okay. blue sky wish list, okay. things we'd like to see initially. And then we'll be listening to people who are bringing us ideas and, uh, and then changing as the situation changes. Moving forward, what, what happens? Are, are, are there going to be all of these trips? Are you going to have partners in different countries identifying things for you, vetting things for you? And we will have people reaching out to people that we're already interested in as well as listening to uh, people who are eager to, to, to be part of this. What do you imagine of the clientele uh, at Bourdain Market? Are these, for example, in the case of the, of, of the Philippines, are these Filipinos going to I would hope so. I mean, I think that's essential. I mean, if I'm serving sisig to, uh, to nothing but uh, Americans and I failed terribly, no, we want Filipino grandmothers and, uh, and their, their hipster grandson uh, and their neighbors to all find it legit. If not, we failed. Is it an inevitability that when you try to transpose uh, food to an international clientele. Is it inevitable that, that things will, will, will somehow get lost in transit? That, that I hope not. Yeah. We're going to work very, very, very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. As I said, I'll go back to the Filipino grandmother. If she thinks, this is not like what I had at home, yeah. why did you take me here? Yeah. Uh, then we fail. Okay. We need to make her happy. Yeah. First, first. Yeah. The American kids, they'll come along later. The target audience is the people from that nation. Say, oh, chicken rice just like at home. Oh, finally, real laksa. Not fake. That's absolutely essential. If we, if we don't think we can do that, we will not do it. I'll, just, I'll go back to cooking brunch. I'll get out of the market business entirely. If, mm. if it looks like that, that is an impossible goal, yeah. I'd rather not do it. And certainly if, if New York cannot provide all the ingredients for... I, I think I feel cuisine. on stronger ground there. New York's a big city, a lot of Filipinos, for instance, people from all over the world, they've been sourcing their products uh, pretty successfully. You can get just about anything. Have you tried any, any foods that you think absolutely is, is, is something that you would be excited to bring home, but did you actually feel that uh, this will never pass? Mm -hmm. The fire safety and health standards in New York. I mean, it's no. I think the fire safety and health. I think we're 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 well positioned to work with. I think there's a dish here that uh, that I had in uh, Pampanga that uh, seasoned with bile. Uh huh. Uh, and I, I, yeah. I, I don't know that whether that's gonna <laughs> whether that's gonna work <laughs> for New Yorkers just yet. Just okay. yet. Okay. There's been a lot of uh, of things written up about about Filipino food in the past two three years. 
Filipinos certainly get excited every time every time somebody says, "Oh, Filipinos the next uh, Filipino food is mm -hmm. the next big thing." Uh, but it hasn't quite happened. Or would you agree with that? Maybe it isn't the time yet. I mean, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not as quickly as uh, the country would like. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the hottest and most interesting and inspiring chefs in New York right now are either Filipino or, or uh, very much under, under the influence. Can you cite any particular examples? Of Angela de Mayuga at, uh, at Mission Chinese is, you know, pistol hot, influential. Everybody's looking at what she does, and uh, uh, you see more and more uh, uh, Philippines based and influenced food on her menus. Um, Jeepney. And there's another business associated with Jeepney, yes. Leah Cohen, who's part Filipino, I believe. The fact that these businesses are, are doing really well, that people are talking about it, uh, tweeting about it, Instagramming it, th these are important. This is how every other cuisine broke through yeah. recently. Yeah. You think the rise of social media, how, how integral is the rise of social it's media? Everything. Finally making it's this everything. It's everything now. Yeah. I mean, you know, all my chef friends uh, were so resistant. In the beginning, you know, they were used to basically, you know, sucking up to or bribing the same, uh, the same three food critics. You know, that's all you had to worry about was three or four powerful food critics for, for print or, or television media. You had to give them either special attention or fawn over them or comp them meals or do what or stroke them and feed them or outright pay them. Um, you know, in the bad old days, but at least it was, it was a finite number of people, and they reacted rather negatively to this world where everybody with a cell phone yes. could review their restaurant yeah. uh, within minutes of opening the doors. You know, it takes a year to open a restaurant, and five minutes in, they're like, you know, worst meal ever. Um, and, th and they hated that people were Instagramming, taking pictures of their food. Now, I go out to dinner with my chef friends, we all sit down, every, out come the cell phones, everybody's taking pictures of their food and, and we're all Instagramming each other and hashtagging each other. This is the way we experience food now. Um, and, and, and to a greater and greater extent, that, that, that's going to determine who goes to restaurants, is you know, how many likes on Instagram. In many ways, Bourdain's dream to bring authentic international flavors to the Big Apple still has a long way to go. Whatever it costs, the traveling chef promises he will not settle for less when he finally turns his vision to reality. I'm Robbie Alampay for Bloomberg Pursuits.